Hello there. So what do we usually expect from sequels? As a rule, we expect the same game, but better. The core gameplay and theme, but with better decisions, corrections of mistakes, improved graphics and gameplay. At least, mostly. In March 2017, a job description for The Evil Within 2 or Psycho Break 2, the game's Japanese title was leaked, and the first trailer was officially shown to the public on E3 2017. Although the ending of the first game may be interpreted as groundwork for a sequel, I didn't really expect it to happen. The ending was quite vague and DLC made me ask even more questions. In my mind, the first The Evil Within was supposed to be a standalone project. Luckily for us, Bethesda was at its peak that year. The Evil Within 2, Dishonored 2 and Prey were only several months away from their releases after their official trailers were shown. And that was amazing. Unlike today when you show the first teaser with the name of a game and release it 4-5 or five years later. If you ever release it at all. According to some articles, The Evil Within 2 started its development right after the last DLC for the first game was released, in March 2015. Shinji Mikami, the main game designer and director of the game, gave up his seat to John Jonas and became a game consultant. According to IMDb, John was working on The Evil Within as a visual effects designer and worked on the DLC as well. Since the plot of the first game was extremely overcomplicated, it was decided to write the plot of the second game more straightforward and less frustrating. Even if you didn't play the game or didn't watch my previous videos, I'll shortly retell you the plot of the first game. If you're aware of it, you can skip this part and jump right over here. The story of the first game revolves around a certain STEM system that is able to combine the minds of different people into one and its creator, Ruben Victoriano or Rubik. The main nuance of this machine is that it needs the main mind to rule them all. In other words, the core. Rubik is a genius psychopath who mainly created STEM with his partner Marcelo Jimenez and at some point started working with the secret organization Mobius that wanted to use it pursuing their own benefits. After some disagreements with Mobius, Rubik optimized the machine to work only with his own brainwaves. As a countermeasure, Mobius decided to dismember Rubik and literally use only his brain as a core. Mobius realized that using the brain of a psychopath as a core is probably not the best idea and found another person with similar brainwaves, Leslie Withers, who was situated in Beacon Mental Hospital. While trying to capture Leslie from the hospital that belongs to Mobius, Marcelo Jimenez activates wireless STEM and all nearby people, at least presumably, got sucked into STEM combining all minds together. Ruvik, feeling the opportunity to override his personality onto Leslie, because they have similar brainwaves, kills everyone who stands in his way. Actually, not really, but let's keep it simple. Detective Sebastian Castellanos, the main protagonist, Joseph Oda and Julie Kidman, Sebastian's subordinate and pluralistically an agent of Mobius, take the case considering the massacre in Beacon Mental Hospital. Of course, they were also sucked into STEM along the way. As a result, Ruvik manages to override his personality onto Leslie and leave Beacon. Kind of. I don't know, seriously, I have four videos dedicated to this game and I'm sure that I didn't cover all problems in that plot. But more or less, this is what happened there. Along our way we could find Sebastian's diaries where we could learn about his daughter who died in a fire and that his wife Myra started investigating that case and disappeared after some time. The following DLC showed her to us as a member of Mobius. I have to warn you that this video will contain spoilers. So if you haven't played this game yet, I recommend you to try it out and come back after finishing it. So before we jump to details, I would like to point out some impressions beforehand. All in all, the game has become… different, in a good way. But this time it feels more like a European or American horror, if that's okay to say. Not a Japanese horror. But it's not a bad thing, if you ask me. We finally see some character development and along with it, you feel much more drama. And that's not surprising, especially what Sebastian has been through. He reacts to things and he may be vulnerable, sometimes even too vulnerable if you ask me, but we'll get to it. The gameplay in general is much smoother now and feels more polished. Even the STEM engine based on ID Tech engine loads textures quicker than in the first game, but still not instantly. Although I have nothing against plots where you have to think more than two seconds, this plot is much more straightforward. I would even say simple, even too simple for a psychological horror if you ask me. But even though the development started almost instantly after completing the first part, I barely believe that Tango Gameworks intended to do so when they were working on the first one, in terms of the script at least. So the second part takes place three years later. 
Sebastian lives through a nightmare where he fails to. No, no, this is not happening. Wait a sec. Wait a second. Is that an emotion? Wow. <laughs> I didn't expect that all of a sudden, but okay. Unlike Sebastian from the first part, here we have some personal attitude and emotions right from the very beginning. Anyway, where he fails to save his daughter Lily in the fire. I'm not sure whether that was intentional, but Lily as a flower was a symbol of purity and innocence, as one of the interpretations in the Middle Ages. But if that was intentional, it is a really nice little detail. Sebastian wakes up from his nightmare, in a pub with empty bottles around. And once again, I love how this scene makes an emphasis on the fact that Sebastian is a drinker. In the first game it was barely mentioned once or twice, but here we see that he's been drinking a lot. And he's wasted. Nevertheless, I was honestly surprised that Sebastian was even alive. I mean, after everything Sebastian found out about Stem and Mobius in the first part, probably the most rational way from the perspective of Mobius would be to get rid of him, or at least make him work for Mobius. Can you imagine what consequences might occur if only Sebastian could play all the cards right? Yes, Mobius is presented to us as a powerful organization that couldn't care less about such a small fry as Sebastian Castellanos. But in reality, I think they would barely let him just live his ordinary life. In one of the notes, however, we'll find out that he's a valuable subject, who survived STEM and at least is able to keep his conscience. But again, wouldn't it be better if they could just hire Sebastian so they could observe his behavior non-stop? But here we see that he's on his own. Well, not really. Julie Kidman, along with the most two inconspicuous Mobius agents in the world, suddenly show up and Kidman tells Sebastian that his daughter Lily is alive. And Mobius needs Sebastian's help to save Lily. As it turns out, Lily was chosen as the main and the most suitable core for a new STEM machine. And I could hardly believe that fact. Yes, in one of the interviews with John Jonas, he said that after everything Sebastian has been through, he was supposed to have a very solid reason to come back to STEM and experience the whole thing all over again. And now let me remind you of the chronology of events from the first game. According to various documents from the first game, Lily Castellanos was born in 2006. The fire happened when she was 5 years old. It means in 2012, when Mobius kidnapped Lily, they already possessed the core for a non-working machine. And only several years later, Mobius will kill Rubik to be the core for the first working machine, and will be chasing down Leslie, who could replace Rubik as a core. I mean, come on, the game wants me to believe that even before the very first stem was finished, even before they could improve it and build another one, even before they could find another person as a core instead of Rubik, they already had another one? What was the whole point of Leslie in the previous game if they could just duplicate the machine and use Lily as a core right from the start? And not only that. I'll jump slightly forward and read you one of the notes in the game. It says that ideal core candidate must have an unfettered ego in order to retain their own personality while supporting the interlinked minds of many others. Given the parameters, there are only two possible candidates types. Egomaniacs with psychopathic tendencies or children? I beg your pardon, but to put it mildly, it goes against everything I know about psyche and psychology, and even the logic of the game to some extent. I understand why a psychopath may fit in. A lowered sense of empathy, low fear, desire to dominate, stress resistance and all that. But children don't have a well-structured ego. Not when they are 6 or 10 for sure. Not only is Lily described and shown as a little, fragile, compassionate child, which is the complete opposite of an egomaniac and psychopath, but the game wants to persuade me that the mind of a 6 or 10 or 11 year old girl, depending on when Moby started their tests, is able to sustain and control the minds of several thousand or even potentially millions of grown up people? Please, some adult people I know still don't have an ego. Lily was always so precocious, so smart, and observant. She had this way of looking at you, where you knew that she understood you. Not just what you were saying, but what you were feeling too. And in this case, we're not even talking about some mental prince of dead people like in the first game. Here we're talking about at least thousands of grown up, functioning and living people. Besides that, there is a reason why children under 18 are not allowed to watch adult movies, 
porn, buy alcohol in most countries, and all that stuff. Yeah, I know that children get a hang of all that much earlier, but still, there is a reason. By the way, for some people, this may be a reason why Mobius left Sebastian alive, in case they'll have to control or manipulate Lily, although Lily's mother is alive and works for Mobius. But later we'll learn that Mobius told Lily that Sebastian died, so obviously that was not the case. But okay, fortunately I can get over some plot maneuvers for the sake of the whole story. At least until the number of such maneuvers turns outrageous. Another thing that I don't really like in this scene is that the administrator's face is shown. Yeah, his face was partly shown at the end of the Consequence DLC, but he looked so cool in the first game. Like the local Dr. Claw or something. That dramatic shade and the absence of a face trying to pursue the image of a faceless corporate machine. But here he is shown as just a man. One more thing that I hope this game will try to improve is the introduction of Mobius itself. I personally lack some information about it. Kidman tells us that they can rewrite history if they want to, that I can't even imagine the power they wield. But what do we actually know about this organization? Take for example the Umbrella from Resident Evil or Ladi Lulalo from Metal Gear. These organizations are ever-present in their universes. You could feel the power in everything these organizations were doing. They were covering themselves, they had their own values and goals. You could feel their presence in every aspect of life. And their power was shown to us. Mobius is just, let's say, really pragmatic, but that's not enough in my opinion. We are just told that they're powerful and have money. But if I didn't know anything about Mobius and you told me that this whole STEM thing is just a whim of a certain dude with money, I would totally believe that. This way or another, this is the main motivation of Sebastian to go back into STEM. Of course, Sebastian, being a professional detective for years, doesn't ask for any kind of evidence that his daughter is alive, even after he's been dragged to Mobius by force. Both Sebastian and the players don't really believe Kidman, since she's the one who's been hiding her true identity and working for Mobius. We don't have another choice but to obey, and before diving into STEM, she says that there will be someone for me. And someone else will be in there for you. At first I thought that she meant her cat, because how are you going to explain to me the appearance of her cat in the place that represents Sebastian's subconscious? But we'll get to it later. At least this time we have a straight vector and goal in front of us, unlike the previous game where we were just wandering around for 10 hours. STEM entry in 3, 2, 1. This is THE place I was talking about slightly earlier. Sebastian's office and our hub, where he receives a communicator to contact Kidman, where he finds some information about missing agents of Mobius, where he can save, craft, level up and, you know, just chill. Also, if you find slides through the game, you can come back to your hub and use them to chit-chat with your girl Julie about good old times in Beacon. This time, the game takes place in an artificially created town called Union, a promised American dream. As you've probably guessed, this time it is a semi-open world, unlike the previous game. It will certainly have some linear segments, but they will mix with open spaces. The game rewards you for your exploration with green gel that allows you to upgrade your skills, materials for crafting, and even some new weapons. This open world is not that big, but you can enter almost every house and even complete some secondary quests or find some interesting encounters. I know that probably many people will disagree, but from my perspective, this semi-open world works well in terms of narration. Because in games with an open world, you can often catch a dissonance, when after 50 hours of gameplay you realize that your main objective was to save the princess from another castle. But here your main objective is not that far from you, but at the same time you realize that every piece of material may be valuable and may help you to complete your main quest. Plus, with more open spaces you may take a more stealthy approach. Some side quests may be very well done, like the one when you'll have to remember Beacon with its cinematic view. Uh. Beacon. I can't be 
back. Or discover anima. Anima, I don't know. What the? <sighs> but to tell you the truth, I was excited when I first saw her. But after several encounters, she becomes more annoying than scary. She's not officially described anywhere, but she's like a manifestation of STEM itself. Just like Ati is a possible manifestation of the Federal Bureau of Control. I'm not really sure about how it is supposed to work, but some notes describe her as a monster that only some people may see. She reminds me more of a Dementor, actually. She even has that kiss of death or something. But in most cases, she is not really interested in killing us. And if you happen to trigger her somehow throughout the game, you'll be kind of placed into an altered reality where everything is kind of blue and cold, and the same music is playing. The thing is that if this encounter is not scripted, you'll have to just wait until the encounter ends by itself, because there is no way you can kill her only to avoid her. And again, it looks and plays cool for the first couple of times, until when you're stuck in someone's garage and simply can't go out. As you remember, the world of the first stem was created from people's fears, anxiety, experience and all that. To avoid the same mistakes, the problems with personal attitudes, traumas, beliefs and thoughts were solved cardinally. All people who took part in the experiment had to abandon all their memories before entering stem. This way the minds of people wouldn't influence the world of stem that much. But I'm not quite sure, the game doesn't give a straight answer, but memories are either wiped out or replaced. But sooner or later, they would inevitably turn into horrible creatures. The recruiting was being performed through MU centers, about which we'll talk a bit later. Besides, can you imagine that bodies of citizens of the whole city are kept somewhere, while their minds are connected to STEM? We already know that if you die in STEM, you die in real life. Mobius is trying to create a perfect world. But I cannot see the full picture, unfortunately. It sounds like Mobius is trying to create a matrix or something like that. And honestly, instead of just experimenting with other people's minds, attempts to build a completely new society or invent a new political order, they perform the laziest thing in the world, trying to implement the rules of our modern world into virtual reality. It's like having a complete copy of our daily life, but in virtual reality. I don't know, such a wasted opportunity for the organization that almost controls the world, don't you think? Besides Sebastian, there are also some workers of Mobius who were sent to STEM to fix all things up. Unfortunately, they were sent there before they realized that it was not a software problem but the core. And ideally, we should find them so they could help us through our journey. Sebastian goes into the looking glass again, and from this point the game actually starts. Sebastian enters a large hole and... When I first came here, I was really nervous. I really needed to test something. Something that's been troubling me all these years. The stamina meter from the first game. Okay, here goes nothing. Let's check it out. Oh, thank God they fixed it! Now Sebastian is able to run longer than 3 seconds and doesn't die from asthma when the stamina meter runs out. So all of those who tried to persuade me that it was a conscious decision for the sake of challenge in the first game may ask themselves a question. If that was such a good idea, why was it removed from the sequel? We stumble upon some surreal transitions which I personally love like in Layers of Fear for example. There are dozens of pictures and paintings around, rich looking fabrics and Tchaikovsky playing somewhere in the distance. A perfect fortress of solitude for me except for one thing. A looped moment of death of William Baker, a member and team leader of Mobius search team. And although the blood looks like gem or blood from Outlast 2, the overall impression is quite striking. And again, jumping slightly forward, I really love this segment of the game. The pacing is good, players remember or learn new mechanics like hiding and moving behind hideouts. The red light here is not just to be red, but this is the way photographers used to develop a film. The overall aesthetic of horror is superb. The overall art style of the game, unlike the first part, has become more matte, less glossy, but I can't say that I'm against it. We see a guy who kills another man with a knife, freezing and looping time around it, just like we saw earlier. From his movement we see that he's extremely dramatic, but at the same time, he certainly likes what he's doing. And it looks kinda beautiful. 
probably I would be terrified if I saw something in the real world, but here it looks somehow appealing. I personally love how the overall stylistic theme of the game changed from never-ending gore and blood into something even sublime. Many of you may disagree and say that this game has lost its charm as horror, and considering that the game happens in a simulation, mostly developers could put more creativity into the world around them. But I would say that both games haven't been quite horrifying. Besides, in the first game, the core was a genius maniac, whose brain was removed against his will and who tortured people for the sake of his experiments. I don't think that Lily's mind could create something like that, especially if we take into account that she's probably on drugs most of the time. From my perspective, it would contrast too much if a relatively small and perfect town like Union would turn into something like The Evil Within 1. Here we see that Sebastian, just like Kidman, learned to stick to covers and properly move around them. All in all, I really appreciate the aesthetics of this game. The composition, the light work, frames and angles. There are indeed a lot of places where you can just take a picture and it will look good. We follow the man in the blue jacket and understand that he's not just a photographer, but a sculptor as well. If you've ever watched an anime called Psychopaths, this scene may bring back some memories. After some wandering, we see this scene, and at first I was really excited and disappointed at the same time. Excited because I thought that this might be Laura, Ruvik's sister. After all, unlike other people in STEM right now, Sebastian has brought all his previous experience and memories in STEM. And disappointed because I thought that we would have to fight her again. But I was wrong. <sighs> Let me introduce you to Guardian. This is a tall creature that consists of several bodies with a huge saw blade instead of its right hand. We don't have any weapons, so the only option is to run. Fortunately for us, that guy in the blue jacket shows up and gives us a knife. In this case, I think gives sounds appropriate because he just throws it at us and teleports away. Guardian, on the other hand, according to the canons of the first part, instead of crushing its blade on us, decides to pick Seb up and carry him for several meters. Jumping slightly forward, I'll pay much more attention to bosses this time than ordinary enemies. Because in this game, the design of monsters was much less thought through, unlike the first part. Sebastian gets a knife, escapes Guardian and finds a gun. Where were you when I needed you? Later, I was shown one of the most disturbing scenes I've experienced in recent years. This is the place where you'll have to shoot things. I don't know how to describe and properly show this to you, but aiming in this game is rather difficult. At least if you're using a gamepad, not a mouse. The camera in this game is extremely slow, even on maximum sensitivity. Besides, enemies also are quicker and faster than in the previous game. Combine these two facts, enemies are faster and the camera is extremely slow. Yes, you can get used to it, but still, after several years of being in the release, it's not fixed. Of course, if you're playing on PC, you will not experience this problem, but I usually use a gamepad, even on my PC. Sebastian enters one of the houses and finds a Mobius agent, Liam O'Neill. The Evil Within 2 definitely has some cool scenes from the perspective of direction. I'm not a soldier, I'm just a technician. I know. Stop! Or I'll shoot! <laughs> A soldier would have taken the safety off. I told you, we're on the same side. Let's try this again. I'm Sebastian Castellanos. I'm O'Neill. Liam O'Neill. Dialogues are not one of them. It's just a static shot reverse shot like in some RPG. Speaking about RPG, why the hell are the dialogue options there? Is that a Fallout? Mass Effect? A Quantic Dream game? No? Let me explain to you why developers usually give players an option to choose their lines in dialogues. They usually use them to let players choose their reactions, 
This dialogue system usually means that depending on what line you choose, certain consequences will occur. And in most cases, these lines may be completely opposite. Here you have several options that don't influence each other in any way. Like in some murdered soul suspect where you have to click every single line to get all information instead of just hearing out everything we need to learn. The Evil Within is a plot driven experience. You want to know everything and understand how everything here works again. Otherwise, why would you even start playing a plot driven game? And the game gives you a conscious choice to reject the offered themes and just ignore them? Why? This place is another hub where you can save, craft something or upgrade your abilities. In order to do so, you have to come back to your office through the mirror and once again meet that melancholic nurse, Tatiana. What the hell? Hey, let me out of here! Detective Castellanos, what a pleasant surprise. Welcome back. Some perks are hidden behind a lock and in order to open them, you'll have to find a special red gel. Probably the most expensive upgrade to freeze time exists only to compensate that slow camera. Some abilities are much more valuable than others, but I'm 100% sure that you won't open all abilities after the first walkthrough. The branches of perks are almost the same, but this time we have a very important innovation. Stealth upgrades. The most useful stealth upgrade is probably the ability to kill enemies from your hideout or behind a corner. The ability to run from a distance and stealth kill an enemy sounds like a great upgrade. But maybe there's something wrong with my arms, but I could barely make this thing work. How it works? When you reach a certain distance, you will see this tiny red indicator which means that you have to press a certain button and then kill an enemy. Not only is it extremely small, so you can barely witness it, but it also doesn't work most of the time. Sometimes it works like from halfway across the map and sometimes it doesn't show up at all. Or the window of input is so short, you can't even manage to react to this stuff. Just, just look at this, I'm clearly supposed to do this, but I can't. If you know how to make it work properly, please enlighten me in the comment section. Just like in the previous game, statues with keys are spread all over Union, so you can receive some extra stuff if you find ones. Remember the communicator Sebastian picked up in his office. It's used not only to chat with Kidman and other Mobius members, but it also serves as a compass and can detect various anomalies. Just like in the previous part, we can find axes, which we can actually carry with us this time, and another high-tech warden crossbow. Sebastian says that he hasn't seen these in a while, although after playing two games and reading some comic books, not a single soul made an emphasis on such bows even existing. Not a single police officer or enemy has ever made a comment on these. It seems like such bows exist only for Sebastian alone. It's not a major failure or something, but I definitely wouldn't mind somebody mentioning them. The game also teaches us to use the environment. For example, you can break a fire hydrant and use an electric ball to stun more enemies. Sebastian is immune to it for some reason, by the way. Or you can spill some gasoline and fire it up. Besides, you can hide in bushes and perform your stealth kills from there. But since you can barely see around while you're hiding, it may be a problem in most cases. Matches were removed, by the way. You may like it or not, but I'm mostly happy due to a number of reasons. You can find certain recreated memories around the Union. After finding and listening to them, you'll be able to track down some secret spots, supplies or an upgrade for your stock. There's also another layer of Union called the Marrow. Sooner or later you'll be able to get access to it and this is the place like behind the curtains of Union, where all Mobius agents are able to work and navigate through the city. Another improvement from the perspective of your armory is that now you can carry even more guns with you. For example, you may have four variations of handguns and three shotguns. Their characteristics may vary. For example, there may be a shotgun that allows you to shoot two bullets at once and is extremely powerful, but works better in a short range. Or vice versa, may shoot farther, but weaker. Oh, and I almost forgot about coffee drinking. In any of your hops, you'll be able to find a coffee machine that can completely restore your health. But for the sake of balance, it has to recharge. Besides, speaking of hubs, this is not the only place you'll be able to craft something. You may do it on your way in an extreme situation, but you'll have to spend more resources to do so. Besides red gel that allows you to get access to more high-end abilities, there are also high-grade weapon parts that also allow you to upgrade your guns. 
and considering how many weapons there are in this game, I wasn't able to upgrade them all even after my second walkthrough. In terms of bolts, by the way, you can find another type of bolt, smoke bolts. Sebastian reaches the last place where Lily's signal was lost and somehow sees her flashback, where that guy in the blue jacket definitely wants something from a little girl. Sebastian manages to find the place where Lily might be hiding, a warehouse. She must be in that warehouse. Smart girl. Lots of good places to hide in there, I bet. If you managed to look through this warehouse before and now wondering why your exploration didn't trigger the cutscene or whatever, it's just because. Seriously, having some experience in video games, there is a hole in the wall that definitely catches your attention and makes you think that there must be something important or at least valuable there. But this is the place where you cannot go through until you reached a certain point in the story. We find another memory and get sucked into another world that belongs to that guy with a camera. According to what we've seen, this guy is a photographer. Probably he was inspired by such photographers as Zdislav Beksinski, Ega Hosoe, Joel Peter Witkin and Roger Ballen for their surreal and somehow distorted vision. There is no evidence to it, these are just my observations. If you're interested, the guy's camera is called Veritas, which means truth in Latin. Seb manages to get out and sees Aperture, a creature in the sky that spreads its tentacles all over the Union and spawns enemies. Now Sebastian has to get to the city hall through Marrow, since Union is literally falling apart more and more. In the process we'll be able to come back to our main hub several times where Sebastian will find... a, a tear. Was that door there before? What the hell is this? It's a chance to test your skills. Step right up and try your luck, detective. This is insane. You'd be insane to pass this up. Steady your hand and put your shooting skills to work. No need to worry about ammunition in here. And I still cannot express my full attitude to this decision. On the one hand, this is one of those classic moments in Japanese game design, where developers add a joke or awkward moment to ease the tension, kinda saying, don't take everything seriously. On the other hand, it completely rips me out of the game, because 15 minutes ago, Sebastian was desperately trying to save his daughter from a maniac, but now he has time to shoot in a tear, and then celebrates like nothing is happening? You're the best around, detective. And nothing's ever gonna keep me down. Some may say that it's only my problem that many games had something like this. The same Resident Evil 4 as an example. Yes, I agree, but in Resident Evil the overall tone of the game was much lighter and less serious. I could totally believe some bizarre sh** happening there. A dwarf that looks like Napoleon and uses its giant statue like a mech to chase down Leon. This scene alone says a lot about this game. From my point of view, this tier doesn't belong here. Let me give you one of my favorite examples that explains how important it may be to show the mood of a scene. Two similar scenes where the protagonist questions the faith and religious beliefs of a young girl. ほとんど一人分として計算した場合の人体構成成分だ。水 the second example shows that creators understood the seriousness of the moment and it works much better, in my opinion. Although they are just slightly different. We finally reach Union City Hall and Aperture spawns another guardian.
I do love this boss fight because it gives you options. If you have enough ammo, you can shoot this creature right in its face. If you don't have enough ammo, you can find some on the level. You can use the environment around you and trigger some traps installed by that photographer. You can completely avoid any fight with Guardian. Go to the left, avoid some traps, destroy obstacles and simply enter the building. Here we'll meet Harrison, another Mobius team member, who says that we must turn on the emitter that stabilizes STEM. After going through some works of art and enjoying the work with lighting, we finally enter the room with the emitter and get caught by the man who's chasing Lily. You've been searching for me for so long, so I have come. But wait, it's not me you seek, is it? His name is Stefano Valentini. He used to be a war photographer, until one day he saw an explosion that took one man's life, along with Stefano's right eye. After that he got obsessed with one thing, the exact moment when a person's life leaves his body. He killed several women, from which parts Guardian probably consists of. Just like Rurik from the first part, he decided not to kill Sebastian because... Because they're idiots, I don't know. I mean, the guy can literally freeze time and do whatever he wants with Sebastian for more than a minute. But he just walks away saying that Sebastian's fear is not yet finished. Saying that there is some another person who is more worthy of obtaining the core's power and leaving us to Stefano's another deadly creation, Obscura. Her name is a pure reference to Obscura camera the natural optical phenomenon that was used as an origin for creating photo cameras and that was used by a lot of painters at a time. Meet my beautiful Obscura! This monster has a very elegant yet disturbing design. It has feminine characteristics. Three legs, you know, because it's mainly a camera, and its legs represent a tripod. And tendrils that allow it to move on the ceiling. It's rather fast and can freeze time in a certain area just like its creator. It sounds both alluring and disturbing, moaning and groaning. Its name is written in Cyrillic on the camera, by the way. This monster is probably my favorite monster in the game. After finishing this segment, we have to go through the marrow to the theater, where Stefano is hiding. On his way, right before meeting my second favorite monster in the game, Sebastian will see some flashbacks with his wife, Myra. If you won't help me, I'll find out the truth on my own. Which can be a hint of what exactly this monster represents. <sighs> This is Watcher, a mass of intelligent white mucus. We're not supposed to fight it here, only to pass through, but eventually it will catch us. Luckily, this creature has obvious weak spots we have to shoot to weaken it. Then we meet Yukiko Hoffman, a Mobius psychiatrist, and I think it's fair to say that it's her fault. Stem is in this condition right now. She's the one who's been checking all compatible people for this project. Since she says that psychopathy and sociopathy are incredibly difficult to diagnose correctly, it slightly justifies her. But if only a couple of psychopaths is enough to turn here everything upside down, vividly illustrates the flaws of this machine and the whole plan in general. On our way, we'll find another Mobius agent, Sykes. He's a STEM programmer and offers you a deal. If we help him with restoring the server inside the marrow, he'll give access to some sealed boxes spread through the city and you might have a chance to get out of Union. After succeeding, Sykes tells us that every Mobius agent has a chip in their heads. 
And if Mobius suspects that you disobeyed them, they'll be able to do a bunch of nasty stuff to you. Besides, this chip protects Mobius agents from the influence of STEM when they're inside, so they could do work and provide maintenance. If we help him, he'll find another STEM terminal that presumably should get him out of STEM. Slightly later, we'll find a note that says that only one of four people may leave STEM this way. Others will be forever forgotten in a deeper layer of Our STEM. to use a STEM pod as an emergency exit port has been declared a failure. Despite a 25% success rate, the decision has been made to discontinue research. One in four test subjects made the trip back successfully. The other three simply... ceased to be. We believe that the other 75% have been lost in an uncharted sublevel of STEM. A dream within a dream from which there is no known way to return. Due to the number of unknown factors, the experiment has been abandoned. But Sykes is a lucky guy and through the game we'll find a note where he writes that everything's cool and he's waiting for Sebastian on the other side. Meanwhile, the road to Stefano is blocked by two paintings. Okay, whatever. And in order to, let's say, mentally weaken Stefano, we have to destroy these pieces of art. At first I thought that I had to destroy these exact paintings. I wasted some bullets, but nothing happened. But for some reason we have to find the same pictures in the city, conveniently get devoured by them, and then destroy these pieces of art inside pictures. I didn't like the idea of finding the same pictures when they were right in front of you, but I did like the tension inside the pictures though. Especially the one where you have to avoid Obscura again. The sound design is really good here. The sound from Obscura is kinda slightly coming from all places and you feel paranoid. <laughs> we finally destroy the obstacle and enter the theater where Stefano once again mentions some other guy. And despite his orders, Stefano decided to use the core according to his own desires and create art. The core is safe with me. I took her on his orders. But once I realized the extent of her powers, how could I possibly hand her over? He could never understand this. He? Who is he? It doesn't matter. He won't be around much longer. After that, Stefano presents his marvelous work. Behold, my latest creation. No! After some Twin Peaks references, we have to fight Valentini. This boss fight is nothing special, unfortunately. I mean, the fight with Guardian had several ways of killing it. We could use the environment to our advantage, but here we just run around and shoot everything we can at Stefano. His second form is slightly more powerful because Aperture helps him, but in general there is nothing special about this one. I had so much left to create. You've destroyed my legacy. Look at me. You made me into a masterpiece. Must record it. If only I had my camera. Finally, Sebastian meets Lily, who cannot believe her eyes because she was told that Sebastian had died. And, and yes, this is Rubik. Oh, oh, wait, that's, that's not him. This is Sebastian's wife, Myra, and she's in control of Watcher. Those flashbacks about Seb talking with Myra should have given a hint about what this monster represents. The desire of Myra to protect her daughter. She takes Lily somewhere underground and Sebastian falls down after them. I viciously desired this other guy Stefano mentioned several times to be Rubik. Like his conscience, or a part of his conscience, started to corrupt Stem. 
from my point of view, that would be a great connection with the first part. And the fact that Sebastian also thought that he had lost a beloved member of the family in the fire could show us that they actually have a lot in common. Both their families have torn apart mostly because of Mobius. Both Ruvik and Sebastian were used as guinea pigs. Ruvik was used as a core for STEM. Sebastian's despair and downfall were observed by Mobius to collect data. Instead, Ruvik's potential place was taken by some completely unfamiliar guy, but we'll talk about him really soon. Sebastian wakes up in his room and realizes that something's changed. There is an altar with candles and fairly familiar symbol we could see in the first part. It resembles the symbol of Cedars Hill Church and cult from the first game. It only proves that Mobius was in charge of horrible experiments that were happening in the catacombs in the first game, or at least were sponsored by them. Actually, Sebastian visits similar catacombs and torture rooms again. Slightly later, we finally see the main catalyzer of all these events, Theodore Wallace, a master of neurolinguistic programming. Do you remember how I mentioned MU centers some time before? Those were religious centers Theodore was in charge of. Theodore preached complete loyalty to the cult and rejection of all connections with family. That's why relatives of those people who came to this cult never looked for them. Sometimes people were recruited through some medical tests and researches. For example, we could find one woman who confessed that she agreed to take part in sleep research and then awakened already in Union. Once again, instead of killing vulnerable Sebastian here and now, Theodore just decides to throw him away and lets him meet Esmeralda Torres. About time. I could use a little help here. You know how to use a gun, right? Another operative of STEM who possesses some indeed valuable information. First of all, Kidman is our ally indeed. The whole plan was to get Lily out of STEM and taking Mobius down. It was Myra's plan and only now Seb realizes that she's a part of Mobius. Myra, Taurus, Kidman and Theodore were in charge of executing that plan. Myra and Theodore were supposed to take control of Lily. Then Myra was supposed to take down Mobius from inside STEM through the chips in their heads, while Theodore and Taurus would safely get Lily out of STEM. Kidman was outside and tried to control STEM. At some point Wallace betrayed everyone and decided to have the girl for himself and kneel down the whole Mobius. Once again, if your plan of controlling the world requires a girl or a psychopath to function, and if only two people with unstable psyche can turn all this thing into shit, then you're probably gonna fail. You'll receive a signal from Yukiko Hoffman and Sykes. Depending on what mission you decide to continue first, you will or will not get a slight dissonance. Let me explain. On my first walkthrough, I went to find Yukiko and found this scene. You've got to resist him! Hoffman, stand back! No! He doesn't know what he's doing! <laughs> What do you mean, Liam? Stay back! Stay out of my way, Sebastian. Liam O'Neill has become taller, changed his outfit, found a cool mask and a flamethrower. I don't know about you, but I have some Silent Hill vibes for some reason. Liam tells that Theodore showed him the way, and he clearly looks like a boss to you. If you ask yourself how the hell Liam turned into one of those things in the first place, having that chip inside his head that was supposed to protect him from the influence of STEM, I'll tell you, I don't know. The process of transformation of ordinary citizens into horrible creatures is called the Lost Phenomenon. And it was documented that some Mobius operatives started turning into those things as well. But that's mostly it. I have a serious dissonance while fighting him. This is my second or even third walkthrough. And he manages to survive after several maxed out explosive bolts. If he was presented as a monster, I would be totally fine. But he's shown as a human here. Yes, I understand that Theodore gave him power and all that, but again, Liam is still human, only with a mask. I'm sure that many players won't even pay attention to it, but I, I don't know. This way or another, he was clearly presented as a boss here. But then you get out on the streets and 
see another monster like this, literally several minutes later. And, and again, just look at how much damage he can endure with a completely maxed up shotgun. In my opinion, this approach completely undercuts the whole significance of the fight with Liam and just throws him down to the status of an ordinary enemy. But if you decided to help Sykes first, you'll meet Harbinger, that's the name of the monster, first and only then meet Liam O'Neill. Yes, we could meet Guardians several times through the game. And they were different Guardians, but in this case, Liam is a personified enemy, who later just becomes one of those. This way or another, at this point I realized that I missed that psychological approach from the first game, when almost every enemy had a reason to be there. Here enemies don't feel unique. Don't get me wrong, many enemies still have some psychological aspect like Obscura or Guardian. Watcher just looks cool, but that's mostly it. And the environment around doesn't quite change much. Yes, everything is on flame now, but it's the same city. Yes, this is a great way to save resources for developers, and on the one hand, I'm totally fine with that. But on the other hand, repeating the same places over and over in the world where you can literally come up with everything you want from the perspective of the setting feels a bit dull. I understand that it's really hard to create a game, and I don't think that this is a thick minus of the game, but this was exactly the place where it just clicked. In order to reveal Father Theodore, we have to destroy the stable field emitter, and Esmeralda Torres will come in handy. Actually, she was the one who kidnapped Lily and set Sepp's house on fire. This way she tries to make everything right. Okay, here we go. Operation Kick-Ass happening in 3, 2, 1. Are you okay, Torres? Torres? Sebastian enters Theodore's world and accidentally gets tricked and kills Torres. You are doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. <sighs> Unless you join me. Do that, and I can make your dreams come true. Together we can take Lily from my life. Once I have the power of the core, you will be truly free. No. It will take more than bullets to stop me. Will you never learn? You sh shot me, Sebastian. Why? No, no. After that, he meets Myra, who helps to take his anger out on Mobius. It's not his fault that Lily was kidnapped. It just happened. And she's totally right. What you're doing? It's like blaming yourself for an earthquake. It wasn't your fault. Sebastian seems to accept her words and understand everything. And blames himself one minute later for the death of Taurus. It's all my fault. Again. This time Hoffman decided to put her psychiatric skills to use and says that it's not his fault and everything's gonna be okay. Seb says, okay, nice. After the emitter was destroyed, now the world is in tatters, and the only way to get to Theodore is to use something Liam was working on. A mobile field stabilizer that will help us to go through the fire. It works, but Yukiko dies. Almost there! Finally, Sebastian reaches Theodore, accepts his burden, and Theodore decides to throw us back to the first game and once again kill Sadists, Laura, and Keeper. Clearly, three or even more encounters with them was not enough in the first game, so developers decided to add more of them here. Sebastian graciously defeats everyone, and then Myra shows up and kills the guy. My support, honey. You totally could come earlier and help me, right? 
The world transforms again, and to my mind, this whole level could be erased. I think that this whole segment was supposed to be bigger. We meet one new type of enemy and one boss. Oh god. Sebastian meets Myra, the ground breaks, and we find ourselves in a white desert. Here Sebastian will find some memories of Myra and how Theodore betrayed her. In the end, he reaches his house where Myra is waiting for him. We'll see one of the most Hollywoodish dialogues in the game, which is not necessarily a bad thing, just saying. Pain is part of real life, and so is love. If she stays in here, she won't live a life free from fear, because she won't be living a life at all. Myra has been in STEM for too long and randomly transforms into her alter ego, who tries to protect her daughter and keep her safe. Which, to be fair, well, slightly out of control. She's the final boss, and I really like this boss fight. Yeah, you have to shoot her vulnerable points that shine like a Christmas tree at night, but visually she looks great. She has three phases, and between phases she spawns spiders with bullets and heals. The thing I don't really like comes next. Every other boss that we played against died instantly, and his influence on the world dissipated. But here we see that somehow... Myra survived, and not only that, but she managed to climb up the hill. Meanwhile in Mobius things start to get nasty. It's impossible to return Stem back to normal, so after Lily is extracted, they're going to kill Sebastian. Once again, why? Wouldn't it be better for the psyche of Lily to unite with her father? Isn't it too risky to kill him knowing that he met his wife in Stem? Yes, in the following scene, Myra is going to stay in STEM and take Lily's place for some time to terminate all Mobius agents. But the administrator doesn't know about that. Sebastian was a great detective, why not to recruit him? Here, for about 5 minutes, we'll be allowed to play as Kidman. And boy, oh boy. I would definitely prefer a cutscene here. The sensitivity is different, the recoil travels half of the screen. Of course she has infinite ammo, even in the real world! I'm more and more concerned about these agents. One woman manages to kill at least 10 Mobius agents and almost killed the administrator. They are not so powerful as they say, are they? I like direction of these scenes though, how different scenes change one after another. You might wonder why the administrator is not using that explosive chip inside Kidman's head. But she extracted it several days ago. Don't ask questions how she managed to do it, how no one asked what it was, how Mobius didn't detect such a thing, just accept it. And of course the administrator couldn't try to kill her when she started shooting his people and realized that something went wrong and she extracted the chip three days ago. Sebastian has to get out as soon as possible so Myra could shut down Stem along with Mobius. And she does it just like that. Within seconds the almighty Mobius was defeated. I still hope that it couldn't be that easy. I don't know, all this chip situation seems a bit odd. I mean, at the beginning of the game Kidman mentioned several facilities, so there are probably other facilities throughout the world. Where are we? You're in one of our facilities. And it takes only four people to take down such a powerful organization? That easily? I hope not. I'm really sorry, but I personally just can't buy it. I cannot believe that every single Mobius agent has a connection with STEM. More than that, that they are connected this much that he or she can be killed from inside STEM. And of course, even the administrator has the same chip, with no security system, with no two-step authentication and SMS confirmation or something. Sebastian gets out of STEM, and is it just me, but it seems like Lily hasn't changed a bit since we saw her in the flashbacks. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Besides, if Mobius is that pragmatic and stuff, why are they using her whole body instead of just taking Lily's brain out and do what they were doing with Rubik all along? Yes. You see, the more I play, the less I believe in the power of Mobius. It's just one dumb decision after another, and they want to control the world with such an approach. Seriously? But you're awake now. The nightmare is over. There's nothing to be scared of anymore. The final scene shows that Kidman and Sebastian with Lily separates. Sebastian with his daughter ride off into the sunset and Kidman just walks away. 
The final, final scene shows that our protagonists decided not to burn the whole facility to the ground, destroy all evidence and equipment, but decided to leave everything as it was. One of the monitors turns on, and the game ends. These are my final thoughts. In general, this game is much more polished experience than before. At least the storytelling part. Besides, you may have a different kind of experience if you enter a first-person mode, or try classic mode without any upgrades. The combat feels smoother. Yes, it definitely has some horror themes and scenes, but in general it doesn't scare you much. The game makes less emphasis on the world around you and the creatures around you. All in all, this game feels... fine. There's not much to say here, I mean, I've already told everything I wanted to say, but it lacks something. It feels like this game lost its individuality at some point and turned into a faceless product. Unfortunately for me, this is not a psychological horror, although it could be. At least the first part showed us that Sebastian took part in all those events against his will, and was not ready for them, unlike this part. But it's not the only reason, the same mystery about STEM wouldn't surprise us the second time, I get that. But remember when I expressed my concerns about Mobius and how I wanted it to be another evil and thoughtful corporation? This exact aspect could bring so much psychologism into the game. Remember when I said that they had a chance to test other political and social functions in STEM, but in one of the notes they mentioned that they would provide bureaucratic systems and increase the illusion of productivity. <laughs> Not only does it represent the political world now, but they also have City Hall, mention fees and licenses, mayoral election and provide similar measures. But what if we were shown that Mobius was actually doing a great thing? In the first game, Marcelo Jimenez was excited about how STEM would bring new horizons into psychology, pharmaceuticals, emotions, consciousness, and this idea could be continued marvelously. I'm sorry to repeat it again, but we're just told that Mobius is evil, and we have to accept it as a fact. But what if Mobius was trying to use STEM to help psychologically unstable people? Or what if STEM allowed to erase traumatic memories or even treat people, translating what other people feel? What if Sebastian, and more importantly, players could doubt whether Sebastian was doing the right thing? What if we could just let ourselves a thought of sacrificing Lily for a greater good? How cool would that be? Sama, even without a combat, is more of a psychological horror than The Evil Within 2. The ending of Metal Gear Solid 2, about which we'll probably talk in another video, is more of a psychological horror than this game. Sama and MGS2 give you a different kind of horror, but, but still. Because after completing some games, you may just sit and think. You start asking questions, and this way you start exploring yourself and get to know yourself better. And from my perspective, this is one of the most fascinating things games, and not only games, can do. After The Evil Within 2, you don't feel this, although you could. That's why I said that it feels more like a product. The main antagonist seems to have less screen time than Lily. He has no charisma, he hasn't shown us any mind tricks or his gift of word. He could at least break the fourth wall and talk directly with a player. He's absolutely boring and faceless. I would prefer to see Stefano Valentini as the main antagonist. What's his backstory? How did he come up with the idea to take down Mobius? Who is he as a person for God's sake? We don't know anything about him, and he turns out to be the main villain? Yes, it definitely has some strong moments, but in general I think that this game could be so much more. It's probably just my problem, I accept this, but at the same time I just wanted to share my thoughts with you and I just hope you don't mind. It's not a bad game by all means. Bad ideas were rejected and good ones found their development. And this is good, this is... fine. The story makes you ask questions, but far less questions in comparison with the first part. I'm still looking forward to playing the third part if that is announced, but next time I hope to see a smart combination of the first and second games. The psychologism and attitude to art direction from the first part with better controls, gameplay and storytelling of the second game. You dare to destroy my work? You expect me to bend to your will? Just like them, thinking they could sculpt me into what I am not. What they created in here, it's marvelous. They wasted it because they had no imagination. Because they are not artists.
If you have anything to add or correct me, I'll be glad to read your comments below. Thank you for your attention and patience. See you. Happy Halloween. Oh, and Joseph Hoda is somehow alive, by the way. And a conversation for another time, when we're both safe. Just know that you don't have to blame yourself for his death anymore. I've gotta go, Sebastian. Let's finish this and we can talk later.